Good evening, everyone. I'm Cristina Chesarreta, the manager of adult programs here at the Dallas Museum of Art. And I'd like to welcome you all to our exhibition lecture, that 1870s show, The Impressionist Revolution, part of the DMA's newest exhibition, The Impressionist Revolution from Monet to Matisse. The exhibition explores the fascinating story of Impressionism from its birth in 1874 to its legacy in the early 20th century. Told almost entirely through the DMA's exceptional holdings, this exhibition reveals the rebellious origins of the independent artist collective known as the Impressionists and the revolutionary course they charted for modern art. But before we get into it, I'd like to welcome you all and introduce you all to our speaker tonight, Dr. Nicole Myers. Myers is the Chief Curatorial and Research Officer and the Barbara Thomas Lemon Senior Curator at the Dallas Museum of Art. A specialist of French painting, she's published and lectured on wide-ranging topics from realism to symbolism, Poussin to Van Gogh. Myers joined the DMA in 2016 and leads the museum's curatorial, conservation, and library and archives departments. She also oversees the European art collection, which spans painting and sculpture from the classical antiqu antiquity through mid-20th century modernism. At the DMA, Myers has curated and co-curated numerous exhibitions, most recently and critically acclaimed, Van Gogh and the Olive Groves, co-organized with the Van Gogh Museum of Amsterdam in 2021-2022, Cubism in Color, The Still Lives of Juan Gris, co-organized with the Baltimore Museum of Art in 2021, and Bert Morizot, Woman Impressionist, co-organized with the Musée National de Beaux-Arts du Quebec, the, the Barnes Foundation, and the Musée du D'Orsay in 2018-2019. Before joining the DMA, Myers held curatorial positions at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, Missouri, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in New York, of course, <laughs> the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and the St. Louis Art Museum. Myers completed her MA and PhD in art history in the Institute of Fine Arts of New York University with a dissertation on Gustave Courbet, Realist Nudes and her BA in Art History and Archaeology and French at the Washington University in St. Louis. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicole Myers. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. It is always a thrill to see so many people come who are supporters of the DMA and to be here with us as we inaugurate this exhibition, the, Impre the Impressionist Revolution from Monet to Matisse. Before I begin, I wanna take a moment to thank our presenting co-sponsors, Texas Instruments and PNC Bank, as well as our numerous exhibition supporters and DMA members like you who help to make exciting exhibitions and programs like this possible. And I'm gonna do a little plug. If you're not yet a member and yet you came tonight to enjoy this program and see the exhibition, I do hope you'll consider becoming a member. You can even speak to someone tonight to do that so that we can keep bringing you the best of the best here at the DMA of art, of lectures and activities. And a special shout out to many of our lenders for the works that the DMA does not own that I've been able to feature in this exciting exhibition. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I hope you're as proud to see your collection on the walls as I am to have them here alongside the DMA's masterworks. Impressionism is probably the most recognized kind of art around the world. It's hard to think of another type of art that is so popular, so beloved, so familiar, that if I say the word impressionism, most people will automatically picture images like these, Monet's water lilies, or maybe ballet dancers by Degas. Americans in particular love Impressionism, so much so that it forms the backbone of most of our nation's top tier museum collections. As you know, the DMA is no exception, and I love it that we start them really young here in the US. You know, we indoctrinate them through pop culture. So, obviously we are all big fans of Ferris Bueller's Day Off from 1986. I love the perspective not just of us looking at artwork, but potentially of the paintings looking back at us. I also love the fact that when these high school students play hooky, they go to the art museum to have fun. <laughs> 
And of course, when Rose wanted Jack to paint her like one of his French girls on the Titanic, it turns out he had lots of inspiration. I know everyone's eyes were on Kate Winslet, but take a look at her avant-garde art collection there. I mean, you have to love the fact that she had Picasso's Demoniel d'Avignon, but tonight I'm more interested in pointing out the fact that she too had several Monet water lilies, as well as the other shot you see there on the right of a Degas dancer. And just when we thought that Monet couldn't get any hotter, <laughs> Rene Russo and Pierce Bronson steamed it up quite literally in the Met in the Thomas Crown Affair from 1999. Impressionism really is one of the rare instances where modern art has made the leap from the high art world of museums to the so-called low art world of pop culture and commercial retail. We can't seem to get enough of them. We reproduce their images everywhere. Most of us probably grew up with some kind of impressionist art reproduced in our homes, from the containers of soaps to boxes of mints, you know, to my favorite Renoir on our favorite Danish cookie tins. <laughs> and I often joke that there probably wasn't one dorm room in the United States in the first half of the 20th century that didn't have at least one poster of their art on the walls. And as you can see, I speak from experience because that's my dorm room there on the left, complete with a Van Gogh poster and that smaller reproduction of Degas dancers that I blew up there for you to see. And of course, for those of you who know me, you're thinking, okay, Nikki, we know you're an art historian, you studied art history in school, you love French painting from the 19th century, maybe that's not just a surprise. I give you exhibit B on the right. That was my friend's dorm room with two Monet water lily posters. And just for the record, she was pre-med. <laughs> and it's not even enough for us to look at them. We want to smell like them too, or in the very least, to quote this fabulous perfume ad there on the left, we want to smell like the very breath of Paris. It's so aspirational, I love it. We might even want to look like them, as I love in this Italian sort of you know, water lily scented shaving soap for men. In today's day of open access images on the internet, companies like Zazzle, our options are truly endless. We can go to bed with Kaibot, we can watch the sunrise with Monet from the comfort of our couch. Seeing paintings like Monet's Impression Sunrise, the painting that coined the term Impressionism when exhibited in the first Impressionist show in 1874, presented here in such a calm and soothing interior in this online shopping ad for art reproductions, it's really quite remarkable. It gives the impression that this kind of artwork was always in high demand, that it was always appreciated for its atmospheric effects, that its softly moody tones were always seen as picturesque and beautiful enough to invite even into the most intimate spaces of our homes. And yet, that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Though we use the term impressionist now loosely today to describe the aesthetic of short staccato brushwork applied rapidly to the canvas in bright pastel hues, impressionism emerged in the 1870s not as a style, but as a collective of cutting edge contemporary artists who banded together under a common cause to find a way to support themselves outside of the conservative, French-run, state-run fine art system because there was almost no support for their radical approach to painting in the press or with mainstream collectors. In fact, it was the rejection from the government's official salon exhibition, the only public venue at this time for the display of artwork, pretty much anywhere in Europe, but certainly in France. This is essentially the only way that you could garner critical success and attract potential clients their rejection from this salon was what drove these artists to organize their first group exhibition in Paris in 1874. And they were following a model that was inspired by their art heroes, the generation that came before them, artists like Gustave Courbet and Edouard Manet, who had both mounted their own solo exhibitions on the grounds of the World's Fair in Paris in 1867. And that was revolutionary. To say that the artwork exhibited by the founding members at that 1874 show Monet, Cezanne, Renoir, Degas, Sisley, and Morisot utterly shocked the public is an understatement. This caricature that you're seeing there on the right, produced by Cham on the occasion of that first show, doesn't just allude to the French Revolution, but specifically to the reign of terror, 
the most violent and destructive phase of the new regime that was bent on destroying all the vestiges of the traditional French way of life. In fact, the name Impressionism, which the group would eventually begrudgingly accept later on, was given to them as an insult by the French critic Louis Leroy in response to this now iconic painting by Monet on the left that he titled Impression Sunrise. Leroy would say, Impression, I was certain of it. I was just telling myself that, since I was impressed, there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom, what example of craftsmanship, wallpaper in its embryonic state is more finished than the seascape. <laughs> Over the course of the eight Impressionist exhibitions, which were mounted between 1874 and 1886, Critics and public alike were utterly stunned again by this really challenging contemporary art on display. Some of the most common criticisms lanced at the group were that their paintings were garishly colored and horrifyingly ugly, as again you can see there on the caricature on the left that was produced on the occasion of the third Impressionist show in 1877, and this is where Renoir debuted Ball at the Moulin de la Galette, so sharply satired, makes you rethink that cookie tin after all. You can even use it as defense in war. Reviewing that show, the critic Bertal scoffed, the majority of the time, they are awkward attempts, crude in color and tone, without contour and modeling, displaying the most complete disregard for drawing, distances, and perspective. Colors chucked, so to speak, at random, placed next to each other in flat tints with no blending. The search most often for the grotesque and the ugly to undoubtedly produce an impression of astonishment and surprise on the spectator, hence perhaps the name they give themselves of Impressionism. I think it can be really hard for us with our 21st century eyes today to understand why these paintings that we find so beautiful were seen as grotesque. But as you can tell right now, most of it had to do with the bright pastel hues that the Impressionists adopted to convey the optical sensation of light moving in nature. In order to represent nature not as we know it in our minds, but as we perceive it really optically with our senses, the Impressionists turned their back on the Renaissance tradition of muted naturalistic earth tones, as well as the depiction of shadows or volumetric depth using shades of black. That was how you were taught. They instead adopted a bright palette to convey the effects of sunlight again as we perceive it in nature around us, touting that when you see shadows in nature, they're not black, they're composed of a rainbow of colors, especially blue and green, as you're seeing here in the beautiful painting, at least I find it beautiful, by Renoir. It was his application of this technique that caused an absolute meltdown at the Second Impressionist show in 1876 when he exhibited. You know, as you can see, he applied this technique to the time-honored tradition of the female nude in the study, Torso Effective Sun. We'll talk a little bit more about revolutionizing the kind of um, genre of the nude later in the talk, but I will draw attention to the fact that she is not nude, she is naked. She's taken off her clothing, she's still wearing her ring and her bracelet. That was shocking too. But what most people picked up on was the colors he used to depict this effect of sun-dappled light that is crossing the torso. The critic of the Figaro raved, would someone kindly explain to Monsieur Renoir that a woman's torso is not a mass of decomposing flesh with green and purplish blotches <laughs> that indicate a state of complete putrefaction of the corpse? If there's, any, if there's any artists here in the audience tonight, feel good that you've probably never had a review maybe as mean um, or as biting as that. You know, and of course, Sean would play that up in his caricatures at the next year's show. You're seeing some of those on the screen there where there's a lot of making fun of the fact that the Impressionists were using cadavers as models or if they were to show up to have their portrait done, it would have helped them out quite a bit if they had spent some time on the bottom of a river. <laughs> Still another critic reviewing the third Impressionist exhibition compared the overwhelming palette of blues and greens that the Impressionists favored that he saw upon entering the galleries to Roquefort blue cheese. Love the French. You have to compare it to blue cheese, of course. A frequent complaint was that their paintings were too blue or too violet, and Kaibat, poor Kaibat, got the brunt of it. Le Roi, our friend who coined the term Impressionism, said, Merger once sang the symphony of blue. Monsieur Kaibat executes it better than anyone. 
Everything is blue. What he spends on cobalt, ultramarine, and indigo is frightening to think. And another pen, Monsieur Kaibat seems haunted by blue and violet in which his paintings are a little too saturated. Even the most seemingly innocuous subjects, like Degas' Little Dancer, absolutely reviled viewers when he showed it again at one of the Impressionist exhibitions. One critic wrote, I don't ask that art should always be elegant, but I don't believe that its role is to champion the cause of ugliness. The Little Dancer, which was the only sculpture that Degas exhibited publicly in his lifetime, was described variously as repulsive, vicious, and even a threat to society. The latter has as much to do with the social class of the subject and who these little dancers were performing at the Paris Opera in the 1870s as much as the unidealized features that Degas gave to his subject. And it's not obvious when you look at this on the screen. Most of the ones that you see around the country are in bronze made after this original, which he made in wax. The figure was wearing a wig made of real hair and also fabric for the torso and the skirt. So there was real lifelike quality to this figure that really enhanced that sort of grotesqueness that these critics were picking up on. Oh yeah, and of course, you know, this type of threat to public health. If you're a pregnant woman of the upper middle class, do not enter. Um, it could be very bad for your health. But overall, the most frequent criticism lanced at the Impressionists, whether positive or negative, was that they were incapable of making a finished picture. One writer reviewing the 1877 show where Monet debuted his series of the Gare Saint Lazare paintings, I'm showing you one that was shown there now, it really captured this kind of critical zeitgeist around this time, this idea that the paintings weren't finished. So it's a little bit of a long quote, so bear with me, but I think it's worth in sort of reading to you in the original language. The Impressionists are painters who have the audacity to give us a glimpse a simple impression of things without making the effort to enter into the detailed study of line, of color, nor the thousand other knowing combinations that painters of the past had the good nature to be concerned with. A self-respecting impressionist does not put on these airs and graces. He proceeds by the abrupt application of color. He takes his brush and forcefully dabs the canvas. Something shocking results from this process that stuns the viewer and that our imagination is responsible for completing. It's not that there aren't certain qualities in some of the works exhibited by the Impressionists, but they are qualities of a very rudimentary nature. All of them made sketches, not one of them made a painting. <laughs> to understand this criticism, this fear, uh, even the laughter that they receive, we really do have to step back in time to understand just what was at stake. Why were these artists seen as so revolutionary and how they were painting, what they were showing, just how radical their project really was. Until the Impressionist show in 1874, as I mentioned, the only public venue to show artwork was at the Paris Salon. The Paris Salon was an exhibition, sometimes it was annual, sometimes it was biannual, but it was a subset of the Academy of Fine Arts. This was run by the French government, first the royalty, then later different of the regimes that came into play. But it basically was setting the standard for what was considered to be fine art, high art in France at the time. It established a hierarchy of media, painting at the top, then sculpture, then drawing and other forms um, of work that involved more sketch work. It also imposed a hierarchy of genre, that's the subjects that artists were expected to paint. At the very top of the pyramid were history paintings, so paintings that would take as their subject scenes from the Bible, from mythology, from history. It involved the human figure, so again, at the very, very top of this pyramid is the mastery of being able to reproduce anatomy correctly and to really use your imagination, your mental faculties to take stories from the past, interpret it visually in a way that is powerful for the audience for which it was being made for. Below history painting, you would move into some of the lesser genres. Anything involving the human figure came below history painting like portraiture. Then you would get landscape and still life was at the very bottom. So if you were just painting, again, a field or a vase with flowers, that was considered to use less mental um, ability. You, you were seen as maybe not having quite the... the I don't know, the mental faculty, again, to use your imagination to envision humans doing something that you couldn't see at the time. So it was pretty rigid, it was pretty structured, and there were a lot of expectations about how you learn to make the art. 
but also how the art was supposed to look. The public display at the salon was never intended to be commercial. It was not a sale in that way. The intent was, in fact, to educate the French public and to elevate their morals so that, again, putting history painting at the top, you're teaching everyone about history, but also celebrating the values that the French society, the French government wanted to instill in their nation. So here I'm showing you a reproduction on the left. The Salon, the Academy of Fine Arts, were established in the 17th century, and they would go all the way to the end of the 19th century. But I'm showing you an engraving here of the Salon of 1785, where the neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David unveiled his famous Oath of the Horatii. So you're seeing the painting there, of course, on the right. But you can see it captured in this beautiful engraving. If I can actually get my clicker to, there it is up high on the wall, there was always kind of a central court of honor um, where artists who had government commissions or who had won awards would be featured. You can see this is where the term salon hang came from. They were really stacked from bottom to top. So painting on a large scale was something that many artists tried to do to stand out, to be more visible. This is how critics would see your work, write about them. This is how you would attract clients who would then commission pictures from you. And if you were very lucky, you would get government commissions from this type of display. It was wildly prestigious. So the Academy of Fine Arts and its salon exhibition had these lofty ambitions. And to uphold these values, they had a jury. And the jury would then you know, basically review the submissions that artists would make uh, to compete to get into this exhibition. The jury itself was appointed by the French Academy, which had several branches. One of them was art, there's music, there's math, there's other kinds of things. Um, these still exist today in France. So they were the ones who'd be vetting to look at things like the hierarchy of genre, the styles, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. So I'm showing you here two images, um, one a caricature by Domi on the left, to um, many artists' horror at different times, depending on different sort of governments and how they were handling the jury. The jury wasn't always composed of artists, or not necessarily 100% of artists. Sometimes there would be astronomers, mathematicians, all the different types of branches represented by the Academy might be on the jury selecting paintings for the show. So you see Domier having a little bit of fun with how random that jury can be and that maybe they were not the best arbiters of what was great art at the time. And then you're seeing, it's a really large scale painting actually that you can see at the Orsay if you're in Paris at that museum. That's quite impressive. That is a painting from the 19th century. Again, that shows the Salon jury as they're going around to look at the different submissions. I don't really know. I'm going to assume if you raise your umbrella, that means that it's a yay. Um, but there's photographs that go into the early 20th century where they're grouped around holding up their umbrellas, which I kind of love. So as I mentioned, over the years, the rules changed, as did the composition of the jury. There were a lot of reforms that were made across the 19th century. So in the beginning, for example, you had to be an elected member of the academy to be able to even submit to the jury. But that would change. It became more open after the French Revolution that you could compete as an independent artist if you could get your work past the jury. There was just more and more concession, again, to artists who were more popular with the public, even if it wasn't art of the highest ambition the way that the French government would have liked. But in general, what was championed by the Academy and what was reflected in the Salon and also what the state would then purchase for the collections that you now see at the Louvre, at the Orsay, and other national French collections were history paintings, I mentioned, biblical, mythological, or even more recent events in history. So I'm showing you here what were actually the darlings of the salon and the art world through most of the 19th century and certainly in the middle where we're kind of starting our story. You're seeing, again, religious paintings, excuse me, by Bona, a beautiful classical nude. Think of that Renoir that you saw by Ang. Uh, that's an allegory, not an everyday French woman who's removed her clothing to bathe. Uh, my Saunier, who did these kind of more recent history paintings, looking at Napoleon I and some of his um, conquests. And then Jerome, who I think begrudgingly uh, the state allowed to perform fairly well at the salon. It wasn't quite to their taste. I think they found it a little vulgar, but he was really, really popular, and they tried also to kind of harness some of that support, uh, doing, again, you could call it a historical genre painting, where it's not quite a scene that actually happened in history, but a recreation of a gladiator scene. And I love to point out that this painting in particular inspired the set for the movie Gladiator. It's not impressionist, but you know, art's all around us and forming the movies that we see in ways that we don't expect. 
Landscape painting, as I mentioned, although it was seen as a very low genre, it still was gaining in popularity in spite of the Academy's attempt to kind of keep it out of the salons. It didn't need a certain set of education or finesse as an audience to go up and look at it, know what you're looking at, and appreciate the beauty. So while you'll find landscape becoming more and more popular, accepted into the salon across the 19th century, there were still sort of limitations um, to what was considered acceptable in landscape. There was a certain looseness that was allowed in the brushwork to capture the effects of light, again, in atmosphere and nature, but there was still expected to be an emphasis on a well-balanced composition and the use of more or less naturalistic earth tones so that you can make people feel like they're outside, but it still really shows that the artist is composing these in their studio, perhaps from studies that they had made outdoors. So artists would submit their paintings to the jury. The jury would go through, they'd raise umbrellas, they would argue, they would make their selection. They would decide who gets in, and then for the sad artists that were rejected, there was often described in the media an air of sadness and depression around Paris with all the artists who had you know, walked into the salon with their paintings on their back, excited and hopeful, and then sadly were kind of you know, doing a funeral march home with their pictures, you know, stamped, refusé, you know, rejected. Um, and I love the caricature on the right that really kind of sums it up. Again, the importance of the salon for an artist who wants to be able to make it as a professional. And I love that quote, you know, where it's kind of like, well, you can't have my painting. You know, if it's not good enough for you, then the nation will never have this. Um, and this poor artist who's destroying his artwork, that probably took him a year to submit. So it was a really big deal if you weren't able to get in. But for those who were selected by the jury, there were different rules, again, that governed who got hung where. But if you were lucky, you got a good place. It was completely out of control of the artist. But the most amazing thing is at that point, they would hang the artwork and the artists were invited to come and to finish the painting by applying a thick coat of shiny varnish, which is what you're seeing here in this illustration. They're on ladders, they are applying the varnish. This is what signified a finished painting. The varnish saturated the surface, it's shiny, it seals it, it's done. So, so much so to the fact that today the word for opening in French is vernissage, it's the day of varnish, it's the varnishing day. And then once the salon opened, awards would be given that, again, were incredibly prestigious. Maybe you would hear about commissions that the government wanted to make from new breakout artists. Patrons would come. I'm showing you here this great painting of Charles X, who's coming to kind of distribute these awards in the sort of hall of honor, if you will. You know, any artist who wanted to achieve recognition and professional success, they sought validation at the salon. And the Impressionists were no different. Almost all of them, leading up to the Impressionist show starting in the 1870s, submitted works to be either accepted or rejected into the salon. Degas and Morizo are kind of interesting. They were rarely rejected. Almost every picture that they sent was accepted, which is pretty amazing. Also kind of interesting, maybe not interesting, it's a fact of their financial situations. They were also the first ones to leave the salon behind to turn their back on it and to exhibit only with the Impressionists. They didn't have to worry about selling paintings to support themselves, and that freedom from the salon meant that they could become very experimental in their artwork because they didn't need to curry to any kind of favor. Cezanne, poor Cezanne, he tried four times. He was always rejected. Whereas Kayabat tried just once in 1875, submitting the now very famous floor scrapers, where it was promptly rejected. He would show it the next year with his debut in the Impressionist exhibitions, and he never looked back. He would exhibit with the Impressionists for the rest of his sort of career as a professional artist. He was also very wealthy, didn't need to sell his artwork, had a lot more freedom. For her part, Mary Cassatt, and you're seeing one of her salon accepted submissions there on the right, she had no intention of joining the Impressionists, having had all of her submissions to the salon accepted every year from 1868 to 1876. So she's already showing at the salon when the Impressionists are now showing two of their exhibitions. Um, and again, I'm showing you here a work that was accepted into the salon of 1874, the year of the first Impressionist show. It was only when all of her submissions to the 1877 salon were rejected that she accepted Degas' invitation to show with the group. Almost instantly, she changed her style, moving away from the somber tones and more traditional subjects that she'd previously exhibited, knowing that she could get a painting like that into the salon. 
and adopting the bright tones and the modern subjects of her peers that you're going to see, of course, in the exhibition. And I'd say from our perspective today, I think she made the right call. But for most of the Impressionists, it was more of a mixed bag. They were accepted some years, they were rejected the next, and it's not always terribly clear to us at first when they're so close in date what it was about the paintings that curried favor, except for in this instance, I think, sort of proto-Impressionism was acceptable for Renoir in the earlier submission on the left, and then he's starting to get a little bit brighter, a little bit looser brushwork. The drawing maybe isn't so great there, um, and it didn't get in. It's also really interesting to compare these works by Monet that were separated only by a year in their production. It gives a sense of what was championed by the salon. You look at the one that was accepted there on the left and what was not. And the one on the right is huge. It's a very large scale picture. Um, that one was rejected from the Salon of 1867. And I have to mention that that was a really bad year where almost all of the young and liberal artists were rejected from the Salon. And it was extra painful because that was this year of one of the years of the World's Fair taking place in Paris. So all of the world's descending in Paris to see this great art exhibition. And the Salon became, the jury became very conservative because they wanted to control the image of French art at that time. So it was really extreme. This is what I mentioned, Courbet and Manet, who were already well established at this time. They built their own one-man show, pavilions, basically outside the grounds across the street from the World's Fair. And this ultimately is what galvanized these young painters who knew Monet, they knew Courbet, they idolized them, decided, you know what, we're going to come together ourselves to create our own exhibition, because if they won't let us in, we're gonna make our own. But now it's time for me to show you what was actually accepted into the Salon of 1874, which opened that spring. These are the works that received the highest awards from the French government. You're seeing our friend Jerome there on the left with a historical genre painting of Moliere. And you're seeing Louis Priou's Satter's family. So this is what was being celebrated as the success of the Salon at that moment. Paintings like this, you're seeing a beautiful image of visitors, well-heeled, attending the Salon of 1874 on the left. And again, you see those naturalistic landscapes with the tones, the portraits, sort of somber, sort of realist. Um, and another really great work by Bouguereau that was shown there as well, you know, classical. Uh, history and mythology still subjects that were being championed. And it's not to say, though, that artists that were painting in a more modern style were completely repulsed altogether. So Manet would show this beautiful painting of the railway that he'd made in 1873. But by 1873, he wasn't seen as a scandalous painter of Olympia anymore. That was almost 10 years earlier. So he'd sort of come into the fold. So it's, it's acceptable. It wasn't terribly well reviewed, but he's able to get in on sort of his history of merit. And then you have artists like Fantin Latour who kind of walked a fine line between the modern painters and their interest in brighter colors and a looser brushwork, but still doing something fairly conventional in terms of the emphasis on composition, how well balanced the painting is, and even the technique itself. And it's worth mentioning, again, that both of these artists were in the artistic social circles of the younger group that are the Impressionists. They're kind of moving back and forth. So now, all that context, all that background, keeping all that in mind, Let's go back to the first show in 1874, and I want you to imagine that you've just gone through the salon, and you've just looked at that Jerome, and you're noticing that that has received an award, and now you've walked into the photographer Nadar's studio, which was rented by the Impressionists on the Boulevard de Capucine, and you see this Monet on the left, and you see that other one there on the right. Maybe now the shock, the stun, the offensiveness, you know, can kind of come into focus for us where we have Loire, you know, again, chiding them for giving nothing but sketch-like impressions. Um, and I love what he says about the Boulevard de Capucine there on the right. He compares all those little marks that we, of course, read naturally as people bustling about on the boulevard as cat lickings. <laughs> You know, imagine now seeing these bright and airy springtime scenes by Pissarro and Sicily and a rainbow of colors that are anything but earth-toned, nor are they slick in application. If anything, you see all the traces of the artist's hand. And I want you to think a little bit, too, about the varnish. 
The Impressionists did not varnish their pictures. They wanted that matte, bright surface that gives less contrast, that has that kind of freshness. That was deliberate. When you see varnish today on Impressionist paintings, it was likely added by someone after the fact. We've just treated a bunch of ours to take off old varnishes again so that you can really see that surface the way that the Impressionists intended you to. So, there was no vernissage for the Impressionists and paintings like this. Again, tying that into the idea that these are not finished paintings and that they should these are just sketches that the artist made and it is a joke to pass this off as fine art to an unsuspecting public as something that is good for them, as something that celebrates the best of French artistic production. Oh, poor Cezanne. Um, he did the worst <laughs> as you would expect in the Impressionist shows. You know, he couldn't kind of win anywhere. Um, he, he had a tough break. He's tough. I think he's hard still for a lot of us to get into, as important as he was. I think in many ways he remains a painter's painter. But I can't help but read some of the things that were said about him um, because they could be really harsh. So of his take on Manet's Olympia that you're seeing there on the right, there was a critic who says, Monsieur Cezanne can only be seen now as some crazy person agitated by delirium tremens while painting. <laughs> and he did not know what to do with that. Uh, and then there was another critic who wrote, of all the known juries, none have ever, even while dreaming, entertained the possibility of accepting any painting by this painter who showed up himself to the salon carrying his paintings on his back like Jesus Christ did the cross. <laughs> A too exclusive love for yellow has, until now, compromised the future of Monsieur Cezanne. Morizot, Degas, and Renoir, overall, they tended to receive the most positive praise from show to show for their very unique styles and their vision. It might not come as too much of a surprise that even the conservative critics had admiration for Degas because he really wasn't a painter, he was a draftsman. He never gave up that primacy of drawing, of composition, of line, of form. So all the things that they often attacked in the other artists for being too sketch-like was not something that they really found in Degas' work. But where they were troubled was in the social implications of the subjects that he painted. So again, we look at these little dancers and we think, oh, how sweet, but in fact, their nickname were rats. They were the rats of Paris. They were often girls who were 14, 15 years old. More often than that, they came from poor backgrounds, from working class families. And to make ends meet, they were often also sort of kept women, if you will, for men who patronized the ballet, many of whom you will see lurking in the hallways, attending performances, rehearsals, etc. Sorry, everyone, I just ruined Degas for you. You thought you loved your little dancers on your soapboxes, but in fact, it's actually quite edgy, and it says something about modern life at the time that made some people really uncomfortable, and maybe now you guys too. And the same was actually said of Renoir. You know, when he exhibited his beautiful theater box, there was mostly praise, again, for the freshness of the style. Even the ones who hated that kind of sketch like were just absolutely charmed by what he was doing. But there were still many also who were very concerned about the social class of this woman. She seems overdressed, she's wearing too much makeup. Is she a married woman with this man? What is their relationship? Maybe she's a social climber? So there was a lot of suspicion around how these modern women were being painted that made people uncomfortable even as they found themselves admiring them. And now Morizo is an interesting case in point and sort of a study, as I like to say, in the role played by gender and art criticism. And any of you who came to see my Barrett Morizo exhibition a couple years ago might remember this is something that we explored because I do think it's really interesting that while her male peers were absolutely shredded in the press for their sketch-like paintings. You know, they were often attacked, as you've heard, for having no talent or a sickly vision of the world that was a danger you know, to everyone around them. Morizo was celebrated for these exact same qualities in her work. And her works are arguably the most sketch-like and unresolved paintings within the entire group. Her submissions to the fifth show, uh, it held in 1880, which included the DMA's wonderful winter there that you're seeing there on the right, earned her the title from one critic as the angel of the unfinished. But they didn't necessarily mean that in a negative way. Another critic spouted, there is among these canvases, all original, even the defective ones, a series of small masterpieces of an art that we can call intuitive. We were seduced and charmed to the highest degree by the talent of Mademoiselle Morizot. We have not seen anything more delicate in painting. 
Another would gush, the truth is that if there's a single impressionist in the group, it's Berthe Morisot. Her painting has all the freshness of improvisation. Here is where we really find the impression perceived by a sincere eye, faithfully rendered by a hand that does not lie. And my personal favorite by Charles Frusi, Madame Berthe Morisot is truly French in her distinction, elegance, high spirits, and insouciance. She grinds the petals of flowers on her palette only to lay them out once more on her canvas, scattered as though by chance, in spiritual brushstrokes full of the breath of life. This fleeting lightness, this charming, sparkling, frivolous vivacity recalls Fragonard, though without the deep science, solidity of surface, and diffuse light of the master. So even though she was the most praised, even though she was celebrated for being the leader of this group of artists, it was honestly a backhanded compliment because this was considered the best of what a woman could do, whereas the men were expected, again, to use their science, to use line drawing composition. They were expected to do different, to do better. And that is a perfect seg to our exhibition, which I'm going to run through some of the highlights now that I've given you all of this background so that you can be totally stunned and hopefully offended and um, maybe still also convinced of really the innovative and revolutionary aspect of this group in spite of their so-called familiarity to us today. So one of the things that, again, makes them so innovative, the things that you know gave people fear or um, a laugh, if you will, was taking subjects that, again, weren't considered to be appropriate for high art, elevated in the form of oil painting or oil pastel on a certain scale, and again, passing it off to the public as though it was something for them to buy, to live with, to put on their walls. One of these subjects that we find, I think, so picturesque today are these scenes of the bustling Paris, which was radically transforming in this period. This is the moment of the Industrial Revolution. Things were changing really fast. And that sense of busyness, of movement, of the speed of modernity, they were complaining about it then, by the way. We complain about it now. They also felt like life had become too fast. So you see artists like Monet there painting the Pont Neuf in the rain. And what we see is a tugboat with steam that's coming up from the river. We think, oh, how charming. But for those who lived in Paris and saw this transformation, this was ugly. This was industry. This was something that changed their landscape. And it spelled modernity. This was the shift in life that was drawing people from the fields into the country to work in all different kinds of businesses that didn't really exist before. Or you see Passaro there on the right, again, capturing, is it rain, is it dust, is it pollution? I'm not quite sure, but all the carriages and movement on these boulevards, this was something that was not seen as beautiful, and it wasn't something that was supposed to inspire the public. Also subjects of modernity, you know, things like leisure. The Industrial Revolution brought about a wealthy middle class for the first time that might actually have had a Sunday off with money to go and to do things. They might go to the races. Now you see Degas who loved to go and paint the horses and jockeys out at the racetrack. Maybe they bought a ticket to see the ballet at the opera. You're seeing more of Degas' dancers. Um, and of course, with that kind of keyhole perspective and that utterly startling way that he crops the composition, where they are basically in conversation with photography, which is coming into its own as a medium in this moment. Subjects like children doing their homework at the kitchen table, or women caring for their children or caring for others, the so-called feminine sphere, women's world. This now became a subject that was also elevated to the status of high art and was considered something important to look at, not just a simple document of everyday life. As I mentioned earlier, they did subvert many things, but I think probably the most offensive is that they subverted the time-old genre of the classical female nude, which was held up as the most esteemed genre really by the French Academy. So no longer were these mythological goddesses or biblical subjects that were bathing, but these are depicted as modern French women who have removed their clothing to bathe outdoors. So you look at the left, I love how Renmar plays with the illusion that this is a classical bather with her drapery, but when you get in close and look at the detail, you see the ruffle of a cuff and a neckline. So this is her chemise, which was the typical underwear undergarment that women of the period wore. This is a modern contemporary French woman who has taken her clothing off to bathe outdoors. 
And same thing with Degas, it looks a lot like Diana and her nymphs, if you think about some history painting, until you see the cow in the background and you realize that these are not goddesses, in fact, they might just be peasant girls who are you know, cooling off in the summer out in the fields. One of the other things we look at in the exhibition are the innovative approaches to painting, again, that I think we really do take for granted. The Impressionists started applying separate touches of color, what we call divisionist technique, and applying it directly to the canvas, sometimes unmixed. So this wasn't done before. They weren't necessarily making tons of naturalistic mixtures on their palettes. They were taking different touches of blue, of green, of white, and they're sort of laying them down in these different dabs. As you heard, some of the critics noted immediately there was almost like a sense of violence and this spontaneity or how quickly the paint was being applied thickly to the canvas. They paint, and you can see this illustrated so beautifully in the Morizo there on the right, what we say wet and wet. They weren't letting any of the layers dry. All the paint is wet. That suggests it's being made really fast on plein air, outdoors, directly before the motif, because they're trying to capture as quickly as they can these shifting atmospheric effects, whether it's weather, times of day, different seasons. And in order to really boost that, they adopted this very bright pastel palette. Many of these colors were new to the market, they were synthetic and they were brighter than ever, so they had a whole range of new colors to help them do this. But they also broke with how old master painters painted, how you were still taught to make paintings in the academy even at this moment, which is that you didn't start with a white background. You didn't start with a white ground, as we say, that preparatory layer that you put down that will then absorb your oil paints as you build up your layers. So like a traditional painter, even Manet painted this way, uh, Courbet did as well, they would start with this wash that was called an ebauche that was a reddish brown, very thin layer that would cover a white ground, and that was the midtone. So from there, they would either lighten for highlights or sort of go deeper to make shadow depth. That was how you learned to paint. The Impressionists chucked that out the window, and they took those reflective bright grounds, usually white, sometimes lightly tinted with other colors, and that was the background. All of that to, again, increase that luminosity, that vibrancy that would help them convey that sensation of being in nature, of experiencing light, not just painting it as we think we know that we see it. So I love that, again, when you look at the Morizo there on the right, our uh, angel of the unfinished, if you look into the corners, that's all exposed ground, and that was very intentional. It forms a part of the reflections of the water, even the tonality of the sky. So when you go through the exhibition, take a look. Many of the artists, that's what you're seeing is actually that exposed ground, that preparatory layer, and that was really radical. They also took advantage of new technologies. As I mentioned, there were new pigments available, but probably one of the most interesting things uh, that no one really thinks about too much today was that in the mid-19th century, the collapsible metal paint tube was invented. So before this, if you wanted to go outdoors and paint on plein air, as an artist, you had to buy dry pigments. You bought oil as your binder, as your medium. You would mix it. You had to know how to do that. It took some skill. And you would fill pig's bladders into like little containers, and you would take them with you out you know, into nature. They would very often rupture or you wouldn't mix enough or you would mix too much, in which case it would dry out after a couple of days and pigments were really expensive. So it wasn't so easy just to go outside and paint a lot outdoors, certainly of a certain scale because of that. But once you had the collapsible metal paint tube, everything changed because the paint didn't dry out anymore. And then you also didn't have to mix your own colors. All the fabricators started producing in that way in a whole new range of colors. Suddenly anyone could become a Sunday painter you know, work five days a week. Paul Gauguin did that, he started as a stockbroker, became a Sunday painter, eventually became, you know, professional artist in the Impressionist circle. So there was this kind of boom, if you will, in all kinds of Sunday painters. And they took, advance, they took advantage of advances also in transportation. So this period also saw the expansion of the railway network in France. So suddenly from Paris, you could go in all directions, not just the local suburbs, as many of the Impressionists did in the beginning, but you could go to the coast, you could go to Nice, you could go to the south. So you'll see that as well in the exhibition, that they're moving around to different places. And in this wonderful Renoir, that's one of my favorites in the Reeves collection, what you're seeing in the background, again, we think is so picturesque, it's so beautiful, I can feel the breeze on my face. That was a new iron railway bridge that was seen as extraordinarily ugly. This is modernity that is marring nature, celebrated by some and loathed by others. So there's that tension that you often find in these pictures that we find 
so beautiful, but that suggested other things again to folks at the time. I like to put these two up. You'll see this incredible sketch by Monet on the left that is one of the works that's on loan to us from a local collector that is just absolutely spectacular. In the winter of 1879, Monet, who was living out in one of the suburbs, we decided that he wanted to capture what was the after effect of a brutally cold winter that saw the Seine and many of his tributaries absolutely freeze up and then start to unthaw in early 1880s. So he grabs a bunch of canvases, he goes out, he paints both directions up and down. They're not tiny, but they're still smaller scaled portable canvases that he's taking with him outdoors to paint these effects. So you're seeing the preparatory sketch by Monet there on the left, painted rapidly again to capture those effects. But what's interesting is at this point, he's been exhibiting with the Impressionists for a couple of years. They are critical failures. They are commercial failures. He's struggling to feed his family and to sell. And he realizes, I've got to try to go back to the salon because that's still the premier place to make a career, to support yourself. And so in order to have a salon-worthy painting, you've got to take these studies and you have to work with them in your studio to create a composed, more finished picture in the attempt to try to get it in. So you see him doing that with that larger version there on the right. So it still looks very sketch-like, but there is a difference, and I hope you can detect that, that that's a moment of Monet taking a study made outdoors into the studio and trying to pass something off. And he was really excited about this picture, but when making a selection of what he would actually submit to the salon of these studies of the ice flows, he realized, in fact, that this one was probably not gonna get in. As he liked to say, he would need to submit something more discreet, more bourgeois, and that this one was maybe too much to his taste to send. So he already recognized that even you know a more finished um, version was not gonna pass. Instead, what he submitted was the DMA's Senna Lava Cour and the painting that you see there uh, at the Shelburne Museum on the right. Which one do you think got into the salon and which one was rejected? One on the left? Yeah, so the DMA's painting is the one that was accepted. By the way, I love that he took his studies and made them summer. These were all painted in the winter, by the way. And I think, I don't even have to tell you at this point what it was on the one on the right that probably offended the salon jury and why it didn't get in. This was the last time Monet tried to get into the salon. That was his last salon picture. And interesting in our history, that was the first Impressionist painting that the DMA acquired in 1938 through the Munger Fund. So I mentioned before the divisionist brush strokes was one of these kind of painting techniques that made the Impressionists so revolutionary. Another was that they applied color theory somewhat intuitively. So, for example, the theory of contrasting complementary colors like red and green, these are opposites on their color wheel. They would use them to put next to each other in these separate strokes of paint to increase the overall vibrancy to really kind of make it, again, project light outwards. Kayabat's a master of this, that painting. I always say to myself, it looks like someone opened a window on the wall. It just projects light. It's an incredible effect. And you see Van Gogh in his short-lived Impressionist moment. He arrived in Paris in 1886, which would be the year of the last Impressionist show where Seurat debuts his giant grand jot that we saw Cameron and Ferris Bueller's day off communing with earlier this evening. His painting done in tonalities of green and that red border that he painted to offset the red and green contrasting complements. And now I'm going to go very, very fast um, just to again pick up some of the themes that you're going to very soon, I'm gonna release you, explore and enjoy for yourself tonight. But if the first half of our exhibition really looks at the Impressionists, how radical they were, and I hope you are starting to see them and appreciate them in a very different light. The second half of the show walks you through what happened, what happened after, why did it stop, or at least the exhibitions, I should say. So in 1886, the young Georges Seurat unveiled his new style, which he'd sort of been hiding, um, that he called chromoluminarism, not very catchy. It's today what we call neo-impressionism or pointillism, where he took the color theory that the impressionists had been applying more or less intuitively, and he really made it a science. Instead of having sort of short stabs of divided brushstroke, he did precise points of color, again, using these different color theories, laid them very close, one next to the other, and the expectation was that you, as the viewer, when standing from a distance, that rather than mixing colors on the palette, you would mix it in your eye. Optical mixture is what he called it, and it was supposed to kind of be the end all, you know, of how you could depict, basically, atmosphere around you. 
What's interesting is that when he unveils it at the Impressionist exhibition, it was like a bomb went off. I think for artists, they didn't expect Impressionism to get pushed to that end, and that was as scientific as you could possibly make it, and you're seeing here works by Signac, who was his diehard, dedicated friend, acolyte follower, the only artist that would continue to work in a pointillist way up into the 20th century, and he's sort of a key figure in what happens after, and Camille Pissarro, who experimented very briefly, but with very brilliant effects. Most artists at that point started to question what the validity was for a style like this. Monet and Renoir, you know, we know that they felt like maybe they'd gone in the wrong direction, that there wasn't anything solid in their artwork, that there wasn't, it was too ephemeral, that it was too artificial, that it was too superficial and all about looks, maybe, and less about what was on the inside. And after this moment, almost all the artists would basically flee from Paris and start spending more and more time elsewhere by themselves to kind of think about what is now the direction of modern art? We took, you know, we took Impressionism to its scientific end, and now what? And that's what you're going to see when you go through the rest of the exhibition where we have artists like Gauguin who exhibited with the Impressionists five times starting in 1879. He would go first to Brittany with his friend Emile Bernard, and then even further afield to Tahiti and the Marquesas in search of what he considered to be a more authentic, quote unquote, uncivilized, quote unquote, primitive way of painting that he associated with what he thought were less civilized societies outside of Paris and eventually France. They're still taking this idea of dividing vibrant color, but now in flat patches and a much more decorative effect that was intended to say something about the subjective experience of the artist rather than just a reflection of how we perceive the world. We have artists like Anquetin, for example, and Toulouse-Lautrec, who are starting to show more of the grittier side of urban life in a modern society in Paris by showing different levels of courtesans working in Paris. And then, of course, there's also Van Gogh, who was close with both Gauguin, Anquetin, and Bernard, as they were all discussing and inventing different styles. But Van Gogh is interesting because he always considered himself first a realist, second an impressionist even though we see him neither today, but here is where we see, I think, again, that impressionist legacy with an artist that divides color, plays with um, divisionism, but then at the same time was very invested in imbuing his works with symbolic meaning that were personal to him or that would have this kind of lasting um, meaning to the visitors that we are now today to his artwork that they would take forward. And then from there, in the very last gallery, you're going to see just a few of the 20th century modern movements that can trace their roots literally to 40 years earlier with the Impressionists. Um, I like to remind everyone that, you know, in 1900, it's not like all the Impressionists died and then suddenly we have, you know, Mondrian and we have Matisse and we have modernism and that it was just that neat and clean. Monet, Renoir, Cassatt, Degas, so they lived into the 20th century. Many of them lived through World War I. They saw the birth of these movements that started with their innovations 40 years earlier. So you, know, you see Duran there on the left. He and the young Henri Matisse, they went down to southern France. They spent time with Signac. They picked up this idea of divisionism. They created a style that they would then get the kind of slur. They were called the fauves in the press in the early 20th century. But you can see that kind of outlet of what the Impressionists were doing, again, now carried and shifted in a different direction, but still celebrating the same ideas. Um, I cheated a little bit with the exhibition. I say that the show goes from 1870 to 1925, but for selfish reasons, I wanted to see our Matisse Ivy, which skips ahead in time to the mid 20th century. I had never seen it uh, before and wanted to bring it out. It's massive, it's beautiful. This was done as a maquette a year before Matisse would die. He's still playing, it's a maquette for stained glass to be fair, but he's still playing with contrasting complementary colors and dividing the color into different strokes, if you will, of painted paper to depict the natural world of ivy. So that's one of the threads we look at, and my last slide now is one of the others with Van Gogh and Gauguin, who sadly had no success in their lifetimes, but not long after both of them died, one in the late 19th century, the other in the opening years of the 20th century, suddenly were being given huge exhibitions in Paris, Amsterdam, Berlin, Dresden, as early as 1905, 06, 07, that would then inspire a whole other generation of artists that would develop abstraction, essentially, 
and German Expressionism, and I'm showing you some examples of Expressionism there on the screen. So here is where I'm going to leave you tonight. I hope I have scandalized you. I hope you want to join the revolution. I hope that you will come back, spend lots of time in the exhibition. If you like the show, please tell your friends, and thank you again so much for coming this evening. Good night. And I think I meant to tell you that the exhibition will be extended and open till 8.30 this evening. So if you did not get a chance to go in, go in now. Thank you.